the title. All right. So uh, the the title uh, picture is me with uh, a marine robot uh, autonomous surface vehicle we developed about eleven years ago, uh, and and that was me uh, about thirty pound lighter than currently. <laughs> so I can't fit in a canoe without uh, get it uh, flipped. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'll tell you when this happened. Um, and so today's topic is about how you can collect data in the ocean. Uh, so far, uh, of all the projects I have attended, there are two types of uh, you know sensor networks we can deploy in the ocean to collect data. On the left-hand side, you see the static sensor network. This is a famous Neptune project. Uh, where you install high power nodes uh, in the ocean, uh, and then you uh, install these uh, sensors uh, in this hub, uh, you know, at the sensor bottom. Um, so uh, you can create uh, uninterrupted data streams this way. Um, on the right hand side, you can see like we can use robots that can move around and collect data. Uh, this video, uh, this video was generated, I think, 15 years ago. Uh, it was uh, it was a futuristic vision at that time, but most of these uh, things have already been implemented after after six years. Oh uh, no, more than 15 years ago. I think I think it's probably uh, 20 years ago. Uh, these videos are generated. Anyway, so um, when you deploy these networks, they actually collect different types of data streams, uh, and they all have their pros and cons. Uh, so for the static sensor networks, uh, what you get is what we call the ordering data streams. Uh, in other words, the uh, physical location of these sensors will not change, and they will just uh, collect uh, time series. Okay, uh, and, and when you are using mobile sensors, uh, the data stream you collect is called Lagrangian data streams, where uh, the data actually changes uh, the, the the location, both the location and time of the data collected actually changes. Uh, there are significant differences between these two types of uh, data streams. Uh, for other data streams, the, the benefits is um, they are very uh, compatible with any type of uh, map construction. So oceanographers, fishermen, they, they love uh, ordering data. Okay. Um, and, uh, but the problem with this uh, static sensor networks is usually the cost is high. If you wanna cover a, a larger area uh, with high spatial resolution, chances are the cost is, is going to grow and, and you might not be able to afford it. Uh, on, on the other hand, the grounding data stream uh, only needs small amount of mobile sensors. Um, and it's very cost effective and it's adaptive. Uh, you can go to anywhere uh, in the world to deploy your sensor network and you can collect data. Uh, so you don't have to you know, pay for the installation cost. Uh, but the uh, cons is you know, uh, because the space and time are coupled in this type of data, you really need to use uh, AI signal processing machine learning techniques to process this data uh, to be able so that it can be used by the end user. So relevant to our project, let's just say if you want to have sensors to cover a oyster farm, based on the talks we have listened yesterday, right? Uh, we probably need a, a status report every 24 hours, right? And then also we probably just need some kind of averaged, uh, you know, measurements uh, over the 24 hours for, for most of the, you know, per, uh, gross models. So in that case, you could either put one sensor each farm, or or like like what's suggested by Jeremy, one sensor in a farm, one sensor out of farm. That's static sensors, uh, or what you could do, uh, or it can it doesn't have to be over or. Uh, you can also what you can also do is to deploy a robot to collect some information in a, uh, in a um, oyster farm, uh, you know, every now and then, right? So these two type of data collection methods, uh, I think, are both needed uh, in the uh, span project. So <clears throat> I'm I'm going to give you some examples of the projects that we have done uh, over the last. Uh, 15 years um, that involves mobile sensor networks. I think Alan will talk about more about the static sensor network today after my talk. 
but I will give you some examples of the mobile sensor and what, what can it do in different real life projects. Uh, and then I will talk about how we envision these mobile sensors can be, can be leveraged uh, in the SPAN project. Uh, and, and, and then what are some of the barriers we need to overcome, okay? Uh, so the first uh, example I want to give is a uh, deep water uh, horizon oil spill event happened in 2010. Um, I think we all remembered how severe it was. Um, and uh, I think uh, 300 million gallons of uh, crude oil was leaked into Gulf of Mexico uh, so around this time, I think in 2010. Uh, so this is a situation by New York Times on the right-hand side where each of the black Square uh, on, on the map represents a a you know a place where a nice beach where tar balls are observed on the beach and it, it was devastating for the beach property. You know, imagine you pay half a million dollar to buy a beach house and the next day you found lots of tar balls on you know in your backyard and then nobody wants your property anymore. Uh, so it was quite a severe uh, uh, disaster. And, uh, and, and after this happened, at that time, our students uh, and, and I, we wanted to do something about it. So we just quickly submitted a rapid proposal to NSF and we were very fortunate um, to get funded. So, uh, so what we did was in, uh, uh, you know, about, about six months after the event, like six months or eight months after the event, we went to one of the spots uh, where tarballs were spotted, and we deployed uh, our student-developed robots, uh, you know, to measure the water quality in this uh, this called Big Isle uh, uh, State Park, where it has tidal lagoon, uh, where crude oil has has get into this lagoon from the ocean, um, and also you can see like uh, this is the beach is was still closed, and and BP personnel was cleaning the beach. Uh, and then you see this this hot jet stream that that BP's boat was using to wash the rocks, uh, wash the crude oil off the rocks. Anyway, so we we use student developed robots as mobile sensors uh, to collect data. And this is where my uh, less than uh, thirty pound less uh, picture was told uh, was taken uh, during this project. So this this was a boat. Remember, this was twenty eleven. All right. Uh, it doesn't look cool. The boat doesn't look as cool now, right? After after 11 years, because technology has advanced so much. But this is what we were able to do at that time, to doing some autonomous sampling with a boat equipped with oil, uh, crude oil sensors, optical based, and the uh, the surface robot is able to was able to actually track different sampling paths and collect some you know oil samples here. But the, the problem with student build platform is sometimes not reliable. That's why somebody has to <laughs> be there to, to make sure it works well. Anyway, so we, we have different type of robots and this one was a, a you know, ROV trying to take some samples. I'll skip some of these details. Uh, we did collect some nice data in this area um, for this oyster project. I think, I think this lagoon might be, if you imagine this lagoon as an oyster farm, right? So. This was sort of like a you know proof of concept of, of a survey where you see we have we have um, we have robots that collected this uh, uh, bathymetry data. Uh, we did a survey on this on this bottom shape. This is a very high resolution uh, bathymetry map, um, and also uh, you know using our sensors, we were able to actually collect oil spill data along the track, uh, and and you can see some oil concentrations was uh, uh, was discovered uh, in, in, in this area. You know, what I always wish to do is going back to do it again uh, after 10 years. I, I love to go back and redo this experiment and see what uh, what's the situation now, right? I mean, that, that would be very interesting. I, I had this, I've been having this idea for a long time, but, you know, so far, uh, you know, we got different batch of student now and I don't know uh, what's the luck for us to get some funding to do this again. Anyway, this was a really fun project about 11 years ago we did. Um, so then, you know, inspired by this uh, experience, we were thinking that can we actually make these robots completely autonomous and then work like a swarm of fish to be able to 
uh, you know, autonomously track these oil plumes uh, and, and, and to seek the um, concentration of oil, right? Uh, so for, to do this project, you know, we, uh, to, to, to pursue this idea, we actually get funded by Office of Naval Research um, and we collaborate with, uh, uh, you know, uh, ecologists uh, who studied fish swarming behaviors. So th this, this was a project starting to 20, uh, 2009. Uh, and this was, this was the setup that, uh, you know, Ian Cousin, uh, and then at Princeton University and Naomi Leonard, where they actually can track each individual fish uh, based on camera data. And, and uh, this, this, was, this was, again, 12 years ago. Nowadays, I mean, uh, this, this software already has been open sourced and, and the, the fish ecologists love this software. I mean, they're using this software to track each individual fish. And also uh, a very interesting idea at that time is they put like replica fish, like man-made fish into this uh, test bed and they put little magnets in this fish and use a little mobile robot to control the movement of this fish so that they can create this kind of artificial interaction between animals and robots. Uh, this, remember, this was 12 years ago. It was a very brilliant idea at that time, right? Uh, anyway, through this, we learned a lot about how fish behaves, how they're able to you know, do source seeking. And, and my group was able to translate these kind of fish behavior into meaningful robot behavior uh, that are able to you know, imitate the behavior of fish. On the, the left video shows like initially these, these little fish, this robot fish trying to find this light source, they're not able to do it, but then they start collaborating and doing some collaborative signal processing. And then they're able to very smoothly uh, go to the source. Right hand side is this is a simulation where we have algorithm where we can imitate the fish like going to the food source while avoiding being uh, being you know chewed by a, a a a predator. So anyway, so so these are things advances we're made on the on the algorithmic side. Uh, and the question is, you know, can we put this in real life? Right? Can we put this in applications, can we deliver things that people can use, right? I mean, this, these are always the, the, the grand challenge here. Uh, one, of the, one of the practical thing uh, happens in reality is, in reality, the chemical concentration in water almost always work like a plume. Uh, there's no kind of well-defined spatial gradient, uh, like the light source we created in the lab. So uh, how can we do this? And it turns out that uh, we can learn from uh, another type of animal called the crab. So, and, and they are very effective in processing this kind of plume data. Uh, they have a little neural network in their, <laughs> in their brain that they can turn the spike field into smooth uh, a field, uh, smooth signal field where this, we call this derived signal field. Uh, where you know the, the the field, if you follow the gradient of that derived field, then you're able to actually get to the source. Uh, so 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 these uh, a nice application of this is underwater, uh, you know, thermal vent where you could develop robots that actually go to go to the source of this vent. Uh, so so this is uh, again where we're developing some autonomy algorithms where to learn from both the fish and the crab. Uh, so that we're able to actually uh, go to the source, yeah. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, well, in order to transfer these fundings, uh, these findings, like in the lab and in our, uh, you know, fundamental research into the real life, uh, we need to work with real robots, right? Uh, in, in in my career, I spend a lot of time working with a particular type of. Uh, underwater vehicle called the underwater gliders. And the application is mostly oceanographic uh, applications, ocean science applications. So, so the underwater glider is an amazing type of robot where it actually moves in the ocean by consuming very little energy. It just by changing its buoyancy and use the, the, the combination of you know, buoyancy and gravity to move up and down in the, uh, in the water column. And then while it's doing that, the, the, the water actually generate a, a push on this pair of wings so that it can move horizontally. Um, nice thing about these gliders are they consume very little energy and they're able to actually stay in the ocean for an extremely long period of time. The latest 
state of the art is a glider can actually fly for more than a year uh, in the ocean. Uh, and then they operate uninterruptedly. They operate 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. Uh, if you use a human being to control these gliders, I mean, you got no break. Okay, so so really, we need autonomy for these type to 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 make these uh, type of uh, vehicles to work well for oceanographers. Um, and another good thing about this underwater gliders is can it's a it's a hub. It's a, it's a mobile sensor carrier where it actually carries all different kinds of sensors. Um, you know, uh, a basic CTD sensor, uh, you know, biological sensor like chlorophyll sensor, these of oxygen, nitride, uh, and also acoustic-based sensors even like ADCPs, acoustic modem, hydrophone, uh, and optical sensors also. So it's a it's a very comprehensive platform that you can configure in different ways. Right. Um, well, I know what you're thinking. Well, you know, for Oyster farming, this might not be the good platform because it's the water is too shallow. You cannot put gliders in the, the farm, right? So I'll, I'll come to that. But, you know, I have been working with this, this type of vehicles for a long time. And, and one of our contribution, uh, our specialty is to develop a autonomous software, autonomous, autonomy software to make, to make sure these uh, gliders can operate with uh, uh, as a small amount of human attention as possible. Uh, and, and here, I'm, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what this autonomy software do. Uh, so the glider itself comes with an autopilot. If you give it a waypoint, the glider itself knows how to get there, okay? But the question is, where do you want to specify this waypoint, right? Oceanographers like to specify this waypoint by hand, right? I'm going to plot on a, on a map, and these are the waypoints that gliders need to follow. What if it cannot follow, right? What if the ocean state change? What if the currents increases? What if the hurricanes come? Then you need to redo it by hand again, right? And, 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 and we want to replace that part. So, um, so what we do is we are able to actually integrate different data streams uh, from other type of measurements, from weather forecast, from you know uh, satellite uh, observation, from buoy, uh, and then we incorporate ocean models, right? Uh, computed by these physical oceanographers. Uh, we perform something called data simulation uh, by incorporating this data into the ocean models, and an ocean model is able to make predictions about the ocean state, let's say, for the next 24 hours. Uh, and then uh, we can apply AI algorithms. We can apply, you know, uh, uh, control method to uh, autonomously plan a future path for the glider based on what we know about the ocean, right? And, and, and in the ideal situation, we can completely take the human out of the loop so the glider will be uh, auto completely autonomously uh, managed, okay? So, so the, uh, the first version of this software was, was done when I was a postdoc at Princeton uh, in 20, uh, 2006. And over the years, we have been improving on this autonomy software. Uh, and, you know, just, I think just last week, we got a Python version of this autonomy software. And it, we are about to test it uh, in, in, the, in, the Georgia, uh, in the Georgia coast uh, about maybe next week or two weeks from now. So, so we have been working on this software for, <laughs> I think, for uh, more than 15 years now. Yeah, and, and it works pretty well. We, we did a lot of deployments. Um, and, and why do we need such kind of software, right? Uh, you know, because, again, the ocean is pretty challenging. And, and you could have a lot of things happen in the field, uh, like, like very sharp temporal gradient, you know, means suddenly, like today, everything's calm. Tomorrow, it's completely out of control or a uh, very sharp spatial gradient, like this is a Gulf Stream, right? If you, if you move a little bit to the east, then your glider is gonna be swiped away uh, you know, quickly and, and, and you don't have time to catch it. Um, and also some bioterrorism, sometimes uh, we have remora fit trying to mate with the glider. Uh, and, and, and I don't know why, but you know, they tend to love them. Um, so, 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 so then, and then you have to know, oh, what is the state of the glider? Is it in the right state? So, so there's all these kinds of things can happen when you have a long duration mission. Uh, and, and therefore this type of autonomous 
management software, autonomy software is, is extremely important. Now, now come back to the oyster farming project. I believe similar things can happen too, right? So we, we did need autonomy. And, and because our once our equipment was installed in the farm, you cannot expect farmers, you know, get up three o'clock in the morning trying to get everything working, right? And and, and or or trying to make a plan for the next day, right? I mean, everything the, the best scenario is everything should be autonomously managed, uh, or at least being monitored, being monitored by one person in a central location, like like all, for all the all the sites that these things are deployed. So th these are the things that uh, we are good at. Uh, uh, some of the functionality uh, we can demonstrate, like like this is a you know autonomous path planning algorithms that that we can use to actually plan a path uh, from this RB to RD uh, in a time varying flow field, right? And sometimes this this flow current uh, speed is is going to be higher than the glider speed, so you you have to be smart in navigating. Uh, you have to go with the current instead of go against the current, right? So so we need optimal optimal AI algorithm to be able to plan paths like this, and the software our software is was able to do that. Uh, and also this was one of the earliest work that we believe that uh, we are able to use this software to actually manage more than one glider at the same time. This this was in 2007 where we uh, uh, planned paths for I think up to six gliders at the same time to coordinate their motion, uh, for example, in the ocean. Okay, so so we 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 can use swarms. We can use uh, more than one robot at a time uh, to to sample, to, to collect the data, okay? All right, uh, and then as, as time progresses, you know, we want to use distributed uh, autonomy, right? And, and uh, what we wanna do is we could use heterogeneous type of robots. We don't have to be using all, a single type of robot to collect data. We can use different types of robots to collect data. Uh, and around 2012, we realized uh, this is this was very much related to the idea of cloud computing and edge computing, uh, which is also behind the spam sort of sensor network management idea, where we could have we could have a high computation power cloud, uh, and then we can ha have this intelligent robot each carrying a small piece of this intelligence uh, that uh, that they can actually build a higher resolution uh, spatial map around it. Uh, in their operation area. Uh, and then they can actually share their knowledge across this different type of robots. Uh, in, and eventually this data get absorbed into the cloud. Uh, let's just say, you know, suppose the cloud is a management software that's for uh, all the fish farms uh, in the United States. And then for each of these robots, you could, let's say one robot per fish farm, uh, and, and and each of this robot can actually just do edge computing and then and then and then eventually we get all the data into the cloud. Um, the it sounds pretty obvious, right? But in the marine robotics, uh, one of the biggest challenge here is communication. You know, it's not like we cannot collect data. It's oftentimes is we cannot communicate the data. We cannot transfer the data. So so the problem with uh, with this uh, sort of data transfer is closely related to the difficulty of acoustic communication underwater. Uh, I think in above land, you, you, you know, autonomous driving realm, 5G is, is, you know, people are talking about 6G networks, right? Uh, in, in the underwater world, I think we're probably 2G uh, if we're lucky. Uh, so I think, I think we're probably just 1.5G or something like that, right? right? Uh, the G means generation, okay? It doesn't mean gigahertz, okay? Uh, it, in underwater communication, it's all about kHertz instead of a, <laughs> not even megahertz, uh, let alone gigahertz, right? It's all about kHertz. So, so this is a big challenge here. So whatever sensor networks you develop, static or you know, mobile, um, how can you effectively transfer data, right? Um, and also uh, data is also, uh, also acoustic is also not only being used for, for communication, but also being used for sensing and detection. Uh, this is a relatively recent project we did, uh, fun, also funded by NSF on tracking fish 
uh, using gliders. You know, these fish are acoustically, acoustically tagged fish uh, in the Grace, Grace Reef National Marine Sanctuary. All right, uh, and, and, and you know, like these are the fish tags, right? Uh, uh, some of the small fish tags can be directly swallowed by a fish species. And then you have receivers installed on the glider so that the gliders can listen to these tagged fish and then see where they are, right? Um, so, so during this project, uh, we actually try to calibrate the kind of uh, detectability of this acoustic fish tags uh, over a, a piece of real ocean here. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, you know, these fish tags are pretty standard industry fish tags. Uh, they have pretty standard like detection range saying like 200 meters or something. Uh, but then in reality, when we actually deploy them, when we calibrate them, we found out that the actual detection range varies so much. Uh, it could be as far as two kilometers and it could be as close as 50 meters. Uh, it all depends on the uh, ocean condition. So talking about data collection without, without thinking about ocean condition, it's, it's useless, right? Uh, so so, so this, is, this is some of the research we discovered. For example, uh, the, these are areas where like these peaks are where you know, uh, the tags are, are much easier to be detected than, and, than at these areas, uh, at this time, okay? So this is, a, this is over time. At different time of day, at some a certain time of day, it's very easier to find these tags to to hear this tag. And at certain time of the day, it's it, you you cannot hear them at all. Why that's so? Actually, this is in this particular area is very closely related to the tidal currents. Uh, so when you have strong tides, you get better water mixing, uh, and when you have better water mixing, the sounds propagate further. So it makes the uh, acoustic communication or acoustic detection much easier uh, than some other time of the day, right? Uh, and this is relevant to uh, oyster farming too, right? I mean, oyster farming in the oyster farming area, you know, water comes and goes, it's different ocean conditions, different day. What time of the day is the best for us to transfer all the data, right? I mean, this, you know, we need to find that out. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the magic is <laughs> any location is different. Because like, there's no two locations are exactly the same, right? Um, and, and, and you really need to um, you really need to you know have the ocean science combined with engineering and with practice to actually find out what is the best way to do this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, this is another recent project where you know we use like more than 30 glide, not not me, okay. There's huge project, more than 30 gliders to uh, monitor more than three hurricanes at the same time. This is a big NOVA, uh, NSF and, and, and Navy project. Uh, and you know, this is sort of like simultaneous in-situ monitoring um, and, and data collection where you're able to actually synchronize the timestamps of data uh, and get a, a overall snapshot, a snapshot of what's going on. I know the scale is so big and much bigger than the oyster farming project, but you know, just want to show that these these are the things that that, that recently that we are we are able to do using this mobile uh, sensor networks. Okay, um, and also uh, with uh, with a uh, era of AI coming in, uh, now the vision uh, we have a bigger vision, which is incorporating all this AI planning algorithm, incorporating autonomy, latest uh, idea of cognitive system, cognitive architectures. For example, in this case called go-driven autonomy so that we are able to, this is a simulation where we show that we're able to actually divide an area into boxes and each box we have different sensing strategy and we put in different robots uh, so that we're able to actually pinpoint targets, okay? Uh, so which we call hotspots. Okay, so this is a recent project we're doing, all right? Uh, now let's talk about <laughs> Uh, oyster farming, right? Uh, the, our spam vision. As you can see, like with uh, with the past experience that we have done with uh, you know uh, ocean ocean science, oceanography type of locations, right? Now, uh, what we want to focus on is you know uh, oyster farming economy. Uh, yesterday, um, for the three talks that we have listened to, I think I don't have to convince you how important it is 
uh, to you know, use the latest technology, use the machine learning, use robotics uh, to actually change the practice of oyster farming. Unfortunately, the practice in the oyster farming side is very much behind uh, the technology curve, right? We got all these exciting things that we can do on the oceanography side. Now the question is, how, how much can we actually transfer into this domain, right? Uh, and, and it turns out it's it's not that easy. I, I think I think that's why we I think we deserve the funding <laughs> from us have to do this because it's you know it's not like oh you guys already have technology like let's buy them let's put it in the in the oyster farm and then um, everything will be fine. It's not like that. I mean because the scale is different. The oyster farm is a much smaller scale, much higher spatial resolution than any kind of the oceanography projects that I have uh, attended. I, I think it's kind of comparable to the oil spill survey mission. It's kind of, of that scale, it's kind of comparable, but remember oil spill only happens every 10 years, right? I mean, I'm expecting the next one to happen soon, uh, but you know, like the needs for that is very small. So that's why, you know, after we did that project, we, you know, we, we just stopped there, right? Uh, but now if we, Focusing on this oyster farming, I believe this is a new opportunity we can advance this technology. Um, so, so some of the some of the ideas we developed during the first phase of this project. Um, so, one thing we really want to do is to improve on the pro, uh, process of oyster harvesting and oyster oyster planting. Uh, so, here I want to use the oyster harvesting as a uh, example is we could use very agile, small marine robots to actually do this kind of oyster growth uh, survey where I think we, we saw some of the video streams that uh, 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 I think Mel showed yesterday uh, of, of using the vision as a method to see the, the growth of the oyster, right? And then uh, in the future, maybe not in the phase two of this project, but in the future, we could, we could have autonomous robot to actually harvest harvest this project for the farmer, in, uh, uh, harvest the oyster for the farmer, instead of having the farmer running a boat to do it, right? Um, and, and, and to compromise, to, to reach the compromise, maybe the, the, the next step would be to have this robots to, you know, really find out where to harvest and then guide the, the farmer's boat to go there to do the more precise uh, uh, harvesting. So this is one of the ideas where some of the autonom autonomy technology can be applied. Um, so also we, you know, my group, we are capable of, of doing prototyping. Uh, so, so we're thinking of, you know, how can we reduce the cost of, you know, oyster farmers to, to, to use this technology, right? Uh, so like, like this is one of the first prototypes that we did for wireless uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, which is really low cost. <laughs> this is in 2017. As you can see, it works pretty well uh, on the water and, and it, it's, it's depth rated to 20 meters, which is okay for most oyster farms. Um, and I don't think we need uh, like a glider to do this kind of things, right? Or, or like professional grade AUVs to do it. Uh, I think, you know, if, if, if these kind of things can be built, uh, and, and that would dramatically reduce the cost. Uh, and also this is, this is something we're testing like very recently in our water tank. This is the upgraded version of the uh, uh, miniature underwater robots that you have seen in the previous page. Uh, this one is more professionally designed, more sturdy. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. So on the left-hand side, uh, it's only a, a movement test. On the right-hand side, we can see like it has some autonomy capability to track the red blob, right? And so these are the things we're testing right now. Um, uh, and I, I, I can, uh, you know, I feel like pretty strongly like things like this is what we should we should give to the uh, to the farmer. But eventually, eventually, right? But I, I think uh, you know to to make sure that this this project gets successful. In phase two, we can go for the commercial available solution for now, but in, in the future, I think this type of sort of low cost um, 
you know, uh, depends on the need, right? If, if we have a more needs, I think this low cost uh, vehicles should be uh, the, the, the way to go. Um, and let's see. Uh, and also this is another <laughs> student developed um, robot that that's, can move in any direction. So when we develop this robot, our, our vision is to use it in like this um, salmon fish farms where um, you need to monitor the, the, the in integrity of the, of the nets, right? Uh, so, so this uh, robot has a, um, uh, has a uh, elevate, it has a controllable camera where it can, it can, you can control the depth of the camera and to do this kind of fish net inspection. Uh, so, so, you know, something like this, we can, we can also adapt this uh, in the oyster farming context uh, to support uh, data collection or to support harvesting for the future, right? And these are all, you know, the controls are all vision-based, right? And for communication, again, cost is very important. Um, so any commercial available modem right now uh, a, for reasonable performance uh, is beyond $7,000 a piece. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're actually build a open building, uh, actually we already built it. Uh, we're testing a open source modem called the Blue Bus acoustic modem. Uh, so that uh, I think our cost is probably a couple hundred dollars. Um, and, and so that we are able to actually use multiple assets at the same time in an in a oyster farming environment. Uh, so this is this is actually our blue bus acoustic modem on the left hand side these are the software we ha uh, hardware we have on the right hand side this is the waveforms we're using so um the the modem is able to transmit uh greater than 30 watts uh, and it's able to achieve 250 bits per second uh, over 200 meters okay Okay, 250 bits per second is really low, right? I mean, you're thinking, oh, wow, that's too low, right? For, for, for trans, transmitted image, right? Uh, yes, that's true. However, um, it, it's able to transmit, let's say temperature, salinity, these kind of things is we can transmit very fast. And then with data compression, right? Um, you know, and, 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 and in a stable condition, we probably can transmit a, a low resolution image too. So, so these are the things we can do. And for the cost, I mean, this is, this is pretty good. Um, so that's, that's something like uh, my lab is currently doing. Um, and here I also want this, uh, you know, other than this uh, convergence accelerator, uh, we also have another project uh, for the called MuNet uh, shared test bed. Uh, so the, the idea is to actually uh, develop the full stack of communication and networking protocols open source so that the community can use it with, with very low cost, right? So, so it's not just, these things are not just good for the uh, oyster farming, it's good for research, it's good for our community. You know, we really wanna grow underwater robotics, underwater networking community, get more people to get involved. You know, one of the problems of, you know, the, this community being small was because the barrier to get in here and to do research is pretty high. Uh, I, and also I feel like uh, a SPAM project, an oyster farming project is a perfect application for this type of low cost, open source, uh, student developed platforms uh, to play a role, right? Uh, and then, and then if, if there's a need, we can improve, we can engage professional engineering companies to increase its reliability. Um, so, so that's sort of, you know, some of the visions I have uh, related to this project. Um, uh, and, and last but not the least, um, you know, uh, I, I wanna show something that's not swim, but actually uh, swim in air. Uh, so so this, is, this is a platform we developed called Georgia Tank Miniature Autonomous Blimps. Uh, again, trying to lower the barrier of participation in underwater robotics research because a blimp moving in the air is like underwater robots moving in water. Good thing is it's very easy to fly and it's very safe to the human. Uh, so, so these are the things that we have, we have been doing for the last uh, five, six years and many people are following us right now to do this blimps, uh, to work on the blimps and it's getting more popular. Uh, so 
uh, a lot of these networking sensing uh, autonomy software can be tested on the blimps before it touches water before we put it on um, the assets in the water so i just want to mention about this and this is probably a little bit sidetracked from the oyster project uh, and 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 i'm going to skip this slides because it's almost 40 minutes so uh so this is the end of my talk i want to acknowledge you know i showed a lot of the contents like over the over the last 15 years so there are a lot of people to thank for uh and and also a lot of these funding agents to uh to acknowledge um and and also i want to especially uh thank and I said for supporting some of the key projects over the years, uh, in, in, you know, helping to develop the underwater technology, underwater communication, underwater 